there, everybody. I am very happy to open today's webinar on the weakest link, digital technology and cybersecurity capacity building in developing countries. This event is organized by NUPIS Center for Digitalization and Cybersecurity Studies. And it is part of a joint research project with the Global Cybersecurity Capacity Center at the University of Oxford, the University of Cape Town, Research ICT Africa and NUPI. <clears throat> the title of this research project is Cybersecurity Capacity Center for Sub Southern Africa, C3SA. The project aims to strengthen the region's competence in cybersecurity through regionally focused research on cybersecurity capacity. And by providing countries with a baseline for capacity building and resource allocation, as well as by developing and implementing and implementing locally informed educational programs. The project is uh, funded by the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the UK. A big thank you to, to our partners and supporters. Uh, my name is uh, Nils Nagrus Shia, and uh, I am a senior research fellow at NUPI and the coordinator of NUPI's Center for Digitalization and Cybersecurity Studies. And I really look forward to uh, moderating today's webinar with a really impressive lineup of speakers whom I will introduce in, in a moment. But first, a quick snapshot of the context. The last two decades, the world has rapidly become interconnected and the dependency of cyberspace and its infrastructure is now evident in most sectors. There is broad consensus about the importance of connecting developing countries to digital networks so as not to widen the gap between rich and poor states. But the interconnectedness also creates new types of vulnerabilities. A secure and stable cyberspace is in everyone's interests. As the cyber domain is interconnected and global, it is only as strong as the weakest link. Cyber threats and risks are part particularly challenging for developing countries and nations affected by conflict and fragility. Therefore, there is a need for specific efforts toward those country, countries, as they are developing digital and physical infrastructure, often in settings with weak institutions, poor governance mechanisms and limited resources. Even though this is affecting the developing countries, the sustainable development goals and also the stability of the global cyberspace, the cybersecurity capacity building agenda is not very high on the agenda of the international development agenda. In this webinar, we hope to find out more about why this is the case and also what we could do to improve this, situations, this situation. <clears throat> we ask what are the important factors for successful cybersecurity capacity building and what are the major challenges for implementation? We will begin by looking a little bit at the broader context and the international relations, where we look at the rooms for maneuver and what challenges and trends that can be observed. We continue by focusing on the EU's role in cybersecurity capacity building. Then we will further narrow in, narrow in with a hands-on perspective by focusing on how cybersecurity capacity building can be done in practice. Finally, we take a step back and offer some academic perspectives on the challenges in cybersecurity capacity building and also some uh, perspectives, future perspectives. <clears throat> now, let me introduce the speakers. They are all leading experts of the topic, combining hands-on policy and analytical experience with academic depths. A warm welcome to you all. First out, will be uh, Chris Painter, who is the president of the Global Forum of Cyber Expertise. Our second uh, speaker today is Patrick Pollack. He is the EU's, EU Institute for Security Studies, Brussels Executive Officer. Our third speaker is Caroline Weiser. She is the lead in international operations at the Global Cybersecurity Capacity Center based at the University of Oxford. And last but not least, Andrea Calderado, who is a senior lecturer, lecturer, associate professor in international relations and the director of the Center for Internet and Global Politics at the Cardiff University. 
I will now give the word to Chris Painter for his introductory speech. Chris, please, the floor is yours. <clears throat> Thanks very much, and it's, it's great to be here with all of you and, and all the folks uh, who are listening in. Um, so, so I think the title of this uh, uh, of this uh, webinar is is well uh, structured, the weakest link, because really, that's one of the the problems in this greater interconnected world. Uh, when any country, when any region doesn't have good cybersecurity, it's very easy for cyber criminals, nation states, and others to route their their attacks, route their intrusions through those countries, and also target those countries. I mean, I think it's it's now clear uh, that. As we go forward, every country around the world is going to become even more dependent on digital technologies for uh, economic growth, for social interactions, for government, for everything, really. And that's true, not just of developed economies, but also of developing economies. Uh, and at the same time, we see uh, increased risks in the space, more uh, threats uh, of all kinds, technical threats like giant uh, and very destructive worms that are sometimes launched by nation states and others uh, that interrupt uh, economic commerce and other issues. Uh, theft of personal information. Uh, we, we also see increasingly, and this is again, you know, the victims of this are not just uh, big developed states, but also developing states. Things like ransomware, uh, where criminals will encrypt databases of hospitals, of businesses. And, and as every country, including, quite frankly, the, develop, you know, the developing world and the global south becomes more dependent on, on these, these technologies, these kinds of threats, these kind of interruptions, I think, uh, gain even greater prominence and, and a greater, I think, challenge and, and barrier to achieving the kind of growth that, that countries really need. Uh, so, so against this, I think that, you know, one of the core issues, as I look at foundational issues, for cybersecurity generally in the world is this idea of capacity building, of making sure that every country has the capabilities to deal with these threats, both on the technical level, but also on a policy level. When we talk about cybersecurity capacity building, it's a pretty broad topic. It's everything from making sure that countries have the strategies and institutions in place uh, to deal with these issues and, and quite frankly, to prioritize these issues. Uh, to having the technical capability and training of their of their uh, of their police forces or technical community to deal with some of the threats, and then the international component, which is really uh, of key importance here, that all of the different international uh, uh, and because this is a by its nature an international issue, that those those folks are able to communicate and deal with their counterparts in other countries and have a more coordinated response when we see these unfortunate events. Now, breaking that down a little bit, you know, there, there are a number of things that I see there. One is, um, even though I view this as a foundational issue, uh, we've seen it come up more in international forums. The, there was a recent uh, uh, big UN meeting called the, uh, the OEWG, uh, the Open Edited Working Group, uh, for, I'll shorthand it by just saying for cyber, it's a much longer title, but <laughs> it's the uh, Open Edited Working Group for Cyber. And what that means in UN speak, is that unlike the things that had gone before, which were called groups of governmental experts, which were smaller groups of countries, the OEWG involved all the countries, a whole uh, 100, I guess 93, if I get that right, uh, countries from around the world. And they met for over two years and discussed these issues and were able to reach a consensus just a couple of weeks ago in a report. But what I found particularly interesting in terms of capacity building on this, and you know, many of these countries have very different views of cyberspace, you know, clearly, I think Russia and China have a very different view than Europe and the U.S. on a number of issues, Internet governance, um, uh, some of the threats, et cetera. But almost every country uh, noted the importance of capacity building. It was it was interesting sitting at these meetings and particularly having a lot of the countries in the global south who were sometimes less interested in the debates about, you know, what the structure is in cyberspace, what norms are, what accountability is. What they were really interested in is getting help, that they needed help to deal with these basic issues and they were feeling often, uh, and rightly so, left behind. So capacity building is this, is this key element that we recognize in things like the Open-Ended Working Group, in various proclamations that countries made. Uh, but as Neil said in the beginning, I think it's fair to say capacity building has not achieved the prominence that it needs or the resources it needs. So uh, as you look at capacity building around the globe, 
one challenge I think I have, and this is this is really endemic of cybersecurity more generally, is it's too often at a at a high political level in countries, at a leader level, at a ministerial level, uh, folks look at cybersecurity as this boutique issue, this this technical issue, and not a core issue of their development, of their economic growth, of national security, of human rights, or even foreign policy. Now that's changing, but I think that's still a problem. That that's still a barrier. Uh, and if you go to businesses, including businesses who are investing or are indigenous to, to, to developing countries, uh, they often don't understand cybersecurity either because, you know, when they're hit by something, uh, they don't see the, the, the products going out the door, their trade secrets are stolen, there's other kinds of things that happen. Uh, and so until recently, I think there wasn't enough priority in the business sector. And, and, and then even in these forums like the UN or the development community, and Niels mentioned this as well, you know, there's a very, there's a very advanced development community around traditional development, water, power, food, um, you know, the World Bank, the Interdevelopment Bank, all these things where there's a traditional focus. Um, and the US, US AID, for instance, and, and the UK has a similar one, and there are lots of nation level aid organizations. But often they've not looked at cybersecurity as a priority either, or not understood it. They focused on those core traditional uh, values, and even the UN and its sustainable development goals has articulated a group of our very important sustainable development goals. But cybersecurity is not always seen as one of them. And in my view, and I think the view of many folks on this call of my co-panelists, uh, and the view that we try to promote in the UN is that cybersecurity is really foundational to all these other things that you needed to have this as a core development goal uh, and, and treat it that way, a cross-cutting development goal. Uh, and I think there's a lot of agreement on that, but we really haven't seen the movement that way. That's not something that came out of this open-ended working group, unfortunately. It's something we pushed for quite hard, but there wasn't a complete consensus on this, which is, which is unfortunate. But I think that's where we need to be. Because as long as we think of cybersecurity capacity building as this this thing over in the corner, uh, we'll never mainstream it enough. We'll never get the resources we need because there's a huge you know there's a huge need for this, and we'll never be able to get people to think about it. Now I will say that we are making progress. The World Bank and others are recognizing that cybersecurity is in fact, and we've had a good very good relationship with the World Bank and other institutions to understand that cybersecurity is foundational to developing countries developing their their other infrastructures that indeed often uh, you know internet means are used to control critical infrastructures uh, what they call uh, industrial control systems that those are vulnerable to attack so as countries are building these other infrastructures building cyber at the same time and building in cybersecurity is critically important the the other thing I'd say before I launch into more about the GFC is that the other problem I see in this space is that Again, people think of cybersecurity in its own little box, and then they think of innovation and economic growth in another box. Um, and uh, it's important to integrate those two. Um, you know, you don't, lots of developing countries have ICT policies or, uh, or innovation policies, and they're often done by the economic folks in those governments, uh, and that's great. But cybersecurity is an important part of that too. It's part of the foundation, the road to achieve those things. So as especially developing countries and, and the global south is looking at this when they're developing those innovation strategies those digital strategies they should incorporate and think about how cybersecurity fits in and that's not always easy that doesn't happen in developing countries either there's always this tussle between the security community and the economic communities and often between the technical communities and the policy communities and bringing those folks together is important and the, the last thing i'll say which is say before i get to the gfc is that um you know, another issue I find is this is not something that can be done by one stakeholder group alone. It can't just be done by governments. It just can't be done by the private sector. It's very important to have a multi-stakeholder approach to this uh, because there are different capabilities. It's important as countries develop their, their strategies, as they develop their, their uh, capabilities, that they work, you know, there's work between the government, the private sector, civil society, and academia. Uh, and that multi-stakeholder approach is, is critically important. So, so with that in mind, um, you know, I think the what I wanted to discuss in a little more detail is the Global Forum on Cyber Expertise, uh, which was formed now about five, a little over five years ago now, five and a half years ago now, 
Uh, and it was formed initially by the Dutch, but now it's an independent foundation. Uh, it has over 120 members and partners that include uh, over 60 countries, the private sector, a number of private sector entities, a number of civil, uh, civil society entities and academic entities. So a real multi-stakeholder approach to this issue and its core goal is to advance the coordination of cybersecurity capacity building around the world. They both advance it as a priority, but to make sure you have coordination. I, I, I like to, you know, back when I was in the State Department, we had our own capacity building program, especially focused on, on, uh, on various parts of Africa. Um, I think the problem is, as I said, the resources aren't that great in this area, but the problem is like six different countries would want to train the same three people in the country, and that's not very efficient, you know, or we didn't tailor in the right way. I remember talking, uh, you know, before the pandemic, uh, having a conference with some of the Pacific Islanders, and they said, look, you know, we've gotten 12 different seminars on how to set up a computer emergency response team. That's great. We understand that now. We need help in these other areas. <laughs> so, so you know, making this more rational and making it understand it, and, and I think Carolyn will talk about this too in terms of doing an assessment and figuring out what people need is critical. So there's a need for coordination. There's a need to bring these groups together in a more organized way. And that was really what the GFC was trying to do to promote global cybersecurity capacity building, uh, making sure that countries who need that help can get it, but also to expand the knowledge on this. Um, the GFC works through, uh, four or five different working groups. Um, one is on strategy and policy, which includes national strategies because all countries should have a national strategy. It elevates the priority of this issue, but it also lays out how they're going to approach it. That national strategy should be built by a multi-stakeholder approach. Uh, in that group, it's also included things like cyber diplomacy uh, and, and these discussions about rules of the road and norms, international law not trying to negotiate anything in this platform, but help countries implement it and, and talk about it. So that's one group. Um, another group is on cybercrime. So helping countries deal with the issues of cybercrime, legislation, training, et cetera. Another is on incident response and critical infrastructure. So that includes building national level certs, but also how do you protect uh, critical infrastructure? A another is on education, uh, awareness, and training. Uh, and that deals with exactly those issues, you know, getting uh, workforce issues, other issues which are critically important. Uh, we have another group that deals with uh, standards and that's been a little, uh, you know, that hasn't done as much. It's done a, a lot of good work, but it's still recharting how it's going to go in the for uh, forward. And so all of those groups uh, are really critically important to to how we move this this ball forward because we have different participants in those groups from this whole different community. Um, the second tool that are the, so those are the groups that do a lot of the work and what they try to do is identify gaps, uh, how to fill those gaps. Uh, if there are gaps in, in research, gaps in knowledge, gaps in countries capabilities, they help try to map that on, on an individual level. And that feeds into three different things the GFC does. One uh, is the Sybil portal, uh, C-Y-B-I-L which every time I try to type it on Twitter, it turns it into Cyril, so it must have a brother somewhere in, in, the, in the UK. Uh, the Civil Portal is this uh, relatively new, launched about a year and a half ago, portal that now has over 600 different uh, pieces of information. There, there are things like best practices, research papers, et cetera. So it's, it's a, kind of a one-stop shop for, for countries and others to go and look at, uh, look at these issues. Uh, so that's important. Another is a global research agenda, which is to identify where these gaps are and actually try to commission research to, to fill them. And you'll probably hear more about that uh, from Andrea. Uh, and then, you know, I think what the core of the GFC is, is the what we call the, the matchmaker function, et cetera, is that ex essentially. So that's if a country needs help, they can come to the GFC, they can be part of the GFC, but even if they're not, they can come to the GFC and say, look, we need help with X. And that X could be a national strategy or that X could be, cybercrime uh, legislation, it could be setting up a cert or, you know, how do we do cyber diplomacy? And what we try to do with the GFC is, is put together a group of our different members and partners, folks who are funders of cyber capacity building, folks who are implementers, and really come up with a plan for them and then make sure that plan gets implemented by those various different folks. So that's, that's a key part of this as well. Um, 
And that really, to me, is the core of the group. And, and it, it allows us to leverage a lot of our members and partners' capabilities. Uh, and some of them are on the on this uh, webinar here and can talk to that. So that, that really is critically important. We've had some really good successes in all of those things. Um, so so as I, I, I look at that, that, that has been, like I said, it's been around five years, but it's been you know, really kind of taking off in the last year and a half. The challenges, I'd say, uh, are, I mentioned some of the challenges before, but still we don't have the resources we need. I don't think anyone who does cyber capacity building feels that they have the resources they need. Yes, there's been more attention paid in the EU, uh, the US, Australia, and around the world, and that's great, but it's still pretty much a drop in the bucket compared to larger development uh, funding. And so I think we need to start treating this as an important issue. And, and you know, I and as much as we have some good coordination, I want to expand the GFC even further. One of the things we're doing are regional hubs around the world, speaking specifically about Africa. We have funding for a major project in Africa uh, that we're, we're running uh, partly by the Gates Foundation uh, and then uh, also a position to look at these issues that's helped funded by Microsoft and others. Um, and we want to do even more in Africa because Africa, I think there's a real crying need for for this the, this kind of capacity building uh, really all over the continent. And so uh, that's going to be one of our focus areas. We're working closely with the the African Union. We had our last annual meeting before everything shut down uh, a year and a half ago in uh, Addis Ababa. Uh, so it's a region we take seriously, but we take every region seriously. And I'd say one of the advantages that we have is that folks from different regions, different countries can share their experience and, and what they've seen to help countries in different regions. And so it's both locally based. We work with the OAS, Organization of American States, ASEAN and others, but it's also globally based. So so with that, I think I'll, I'll stop uh, and just say, uh, look, I think this is critically important. I think bringing some order to this is important, but making sure we're actually meeting the needs of these countries who desperately, I think, need this, and particularly uh, as evidence in a post or during COVID when we become even more dependent on these technologies, and yet we see those technologies attacked even more by criminals and others. Um, but this is something we can't wait five or 10 years for. We need to really move forward. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it back to you, Niels. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Chris. It was very interesting to hear your uh, thoughts on um, on the weakest link uh, theory, but also about uh, the consensus in in uh, the UN and uh, also uh, the lack of uh, resources that it, this uh, field uh, really really needs. And I also thought it was very interesting that you shared uh, your um, uh, observations uh, and your thoughts on the, the importance of the, the global forum of uh, cyber expertise. It's important work you do there. <clears throat> so um, with that, I will um, now give the floor to our second speaker, uh, Patrick Pavlak. Please, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Niels, and hello, everyone. I I'll maybe try to uh, talk about two, three topics and um, try to make sure maybe that the, our panel does not agree too much and uh, put a few controversial issues uh, hopefully on the table so that we can have uh, a discussion afterwards. But um, maybe the first issue I would like to start with uh, is that I, I think agree largely with what uh, Chris said when it comes to the importance of capacity building as being recognized at the UN and the sort of uh, an area that emerged as a, as a sort of a consensus policy area on which most of the actors agree. However, I think there is a big caveat there and I'm happy to discuss this later. I'm not sure that all those who claim that capacity building is important always have the same understanding of what kind of capacity they have in mind and what they understand as capacity building. And I think that might be to some extent this um, a paradox, if you want, of, uh, of capacity building, where we see on the surface, uh, see it as something that is uh, very sort of unifying at the international stage, but at the same time, uh, we cannot really stop there and we have to dissect it a bit and try to understand more what um, specific actors mean and hopefully that will also come up uh, during the discussion. The second thing I would like to maybe um, challenge a bit and that's a sort of uh, 
uh, me thinking aloud about the metaphor of uh, weakest link, uh, you know, and the weakest link, the, the chain being as strong as the weakest link, because I see this metaphor in any policy area right now. So at some point I started thinking, well, you know, what's what's wrong with this? Um, and, and where I think that uh, the weakest link metaphor might uh, not be entirely helpful all the time, or as it is helpful in most of the cases, uh, I think what that really prevents us uh, from seeing is really the value of uh, collective responses and international cooperation. Uh, because by stating that we are as strong as the weakest link, we automatically focus on supporting those within the chain who we identify as the weakest or who we think are the weakest. But at the same time, very often those weaknesses can be actually countered through collective uh, action and cooperation. And I think actually, if we really look at what is happening globally, despite all this uh, narrative about the weakest link and many countries actually having suboptimal uh, capacities when it comes to cybersecurity, uh, we have still seen quite a deal of international cooperation that managed to sort of prevent and save us from those big um, uh, implications of cyber attack. So I think we have to somehow maybe be a bit more nuanced as well when we talk about the weakest link, uh, because I think it might prevent us from seeing the value of collaborative efforts that are being undertaken and all the successes that, uh, that come with it. Uh, now, I, I would like to maybe talk about an aspect of capacity building that uh, we don't very often talk about, and Eunice mentioned it in your introduction, which is this capacity building in the conflict and fragile environment. Uh, and I think there again, we work with the assumption that uh, digitalization and digital transition is something good. I think that's again, something that uh, can be questioned. Um, States that are fragile are also among the least connected ones in the world. So to some extent, uh, the value of connectivity needs to be investigated further. The question is how can digital transformation then of those countries contribute to the overall social and economic development of those countries, but also how digital transformation can undermine that development. And I think this uh, flip side of digital transformation is not something we always uh, really look at. So digital transition can be a sort of a double-edged sword if you want, especially for those countries. And this is where the challenge of for capacity building arises. Um, we need to differentiate clearly between infrastructure projects to Cloro's digital divide, where the objective is access from the projects aim at creating more resilient and digital uh, ecosystems in those countries. So addressing this interlinkage between security and development that um, uh, Chris was talking about, I, I think this very often are uh, quite different conversations that, uh, that we should be having. So in other words, how can we do capacity building better, recognizing that also in cyberspace, there can be no security without development and no development without security. You know, it's quite ironic, I think, that at least in the European security context, we have been acknowledging for years that that a nexus between security and development, but it's really very difficult to translate that in the conversation um, between the development community and security community uh, when it comes to uh, cyberspace. Now, I think more broadly, the good news is that the most operations, actually, if there is any good news, are conduct, uh, conducted outside of the global south, outside of Africa or Latin America, if you want. Uh, Asia Pacific, I think, is a bit more problematic as the area. Uh, and I think since uh, 2005, if you look at the database uh, developed by CFR, uh, the overall 31 countries have conducted the total of 358 operations. So to some extent, those big malicious activities that we are talking about are not necessarily happening in, um, uh, in Global South. Now, the capacity building in fragile and conflict context, so the ones that, as you said, have weak institutions, poor governance mechanisms, and limited resources, uh, is particularly challenging, I think, for two reasons. And maybe they, this is also the part of the world where actually we don't always uh, look very carefully towards. Uh, on the 
recipient side, I think most of the times uh, these are weak states uh, and many broader issues come into play. So to some extent, actually, capacity building or should be not that much focusing on cyber per se, but much more on uh, good governance and uh, security sector reform. Now, that is to some, to some extent uh, good news because these are all mainstream security issues that the international community and diplomats uh, and development community have been working on for years. So that, in theory, at least, should be uh, quite easily, um, quite easy to address. Now, on the toner side, I think that raises uh, uh, quite an important question of accountability and transparency when it comes to capacity building. And I think we need to really ask more frequently the questions about implications of capacity building and um, uh, and activities. Now, let me take example of Myanmar, and I I will use Caroline and Andrea and myself and Nopi. I don't know to what extent uh, Chris as a sort of um, examples of actors who have. Uh, been involved in capacity building, maybe wrapped shoulders to some extent with the with what's going on in Myanmar, right? So Andrea, you know, you correct me, please correct me if I if I'm wrong later on, has been involved in an EU-funded project in Myanmar. Oxford has conducted in 2018 cyber maturity assessment uh, in Myanmar with the funding from the World Bank, UK. I think Nupi was also part of that. Now, another EU-funded project, Glassy Plus. Uh, has been also uh, organizing or involved in the workshops on cybercrime and cybersecurity uh, in the region. Now, I think everybody knows where I'm going with that, right? So uh, over years, we have been doing cyber capacity building in Myanmar based on the assumption that that's something that contributes towards uh, economic and social development of the country and improves the resilience of a state and society. At the same time, as we see right now, uh, that can have quite significant implications for uh, the country and the situation of citizens in the country itself. So uh, have these efforts at the end contributed to strengthening the state resilience to the detriment of the society? Question mark. What are the negative externalities of these capacity building efforts? Uh, and, and again, you know, because I'm a researcher by training, I also like to be sometimes very often critical of the work that we're doing. And I, I think that's the one of the dimensions of the work on capacity building that um, that is quite frequently neglected. But that again, paradoxically, paradoxically stresses the importance why that conversation needs to be so much part of a broader engagement uh, between the donor community and partner countries. It cannot be looked at cyber or digital engagement only. It needs to be really looked in the broader context of the security sector reform, good governance or whatever we want to uh, whatever we want to call it. So that really brings me very uh, very briefly to uh, to the role of the EU and I already you know singled out two projects that the EU has been funded so there's a huge mea culpa I think to be done as well uh, on the donor side uh, from the EU perspective if you want when it comes to uh, engagement on digital and cyber issues. I would like to pick up maybe one point that um, uh, Chris has also mentioned when it comes to this disconnect between development and cyber community. I don't know if you guys will agree. I think that another big disconnect that is emerging is this disconnect between digital and cyber policies. I think especially in the European Union context with digital transition becoming one of the top priority areas for the policymakers, uh, everything seems to be put under the umbrella of digital and not maybe sufficiently balanced when it comes to uh, the cybersecurity or resilience component of that, but that's maybe something for, for the discussion later on. Uh, when it comes to the EU itself, as I said, I think there is uh, there is some homework to be done as well. Andrea as well was involved in one of the initiatives we have completed in 2019, which was um, operational guidance for cyber capacity building, uh, a sort of a a set of signposts that my institute has developed with a group of experts exactly to sort of a steel, steer the thinking of the EU and the delegations when it comes to the implementation of uh, cyber capacity building efforts. 
Uh, now, when it comes to looking forward, uh, some of you may be aware that last year the EU has adopted a new EU cybersecurity strategy where capacity building is actually quite present with the idea of developing a cyber capacity building agenda and supported by the activities of the uh, cyber capacity building uh, advisory board that would be a sort of institutional board. So I think to some extent uh, in the EU, we will be seeing in the next months uh, hopefully, I, I should add, uh, a sort of um, reinvigorated dialogue or thinking, if you want, about what capacity, cyber capacity building should be about and in which direction um, we want to take it. So uh, I'll stop here, Niels. If there are any of the points we, we want to pick up in the discussion, I'm uh, more than happy to do that, but hopefully that, uh, that will already give some uh, uh, food for thought for, for our conversation later on. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Patrick. Absolutely. This was a lot of uh, food for thoughts. I, I think it was very interesting to hear about not only the the, the part of uh, digital technology that can contribute to good uh, development, but also on the flip side. And, and you managed also to bring in an example of where most of our, our, us have been involved and then in Myanmar, so that was very, very interesting, and it's an interesting country still to, to study and what, what is happening there and how this uh, technology is being used or misused. Yeah. So um, with that, I'm, I'm sure we will come back to a number of issues that you, both you and, and Chris have raised, but now I will give the floor to our next uh, speaker, uh, who is uh, Caroline Weiser. And uh, we really look forward to hear more about your experience and uh, about the um, cybersecurity capacity building maturity model. So please, Caroline, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, I prepared some slides um, because I was advised that it might be, need some explanation. Um, very quick, um, the uh, Global Cybersecurity Capacity Center is a research center at the University of Oxford. Uh, we're looking into like what works, so do research on what works and what doesn't work in cybersecurity capacity building. And as Neil said in the introduction, we are also um, um, like initiator, but also member of the constellation of regional cybersecurity capacity research centers. Uh, we have a partner center in Melbourne, the Oceana Cybersecurity Center, and we have um, who is also core, like part of this project is the Cybersecurity Capacity Center for Southern Africa, CISA in Cape Town. Um, so yeah, I think it was already touched a bit earlier, um, We what we are doing. Uh, we developed a model to assess national cybersecurity capacity um, based on five dimensions. I don't want to go too much into detail um, because it's available online. We just did a new version. I'm going to speak on this in a second. Um, and it covers five dimensions, very broad. You see it's saying like acknowledging that it's cybersecurity capacity is not only a technical issue, but it really covers a lot of areas, including strategy for policy, culture and society, training, awareness, education, legal frameworks, etc. And the model has, has over 800, almost 800 indicators across, um, along five stages of maturity. Documents available online for those who are interested to go more into detail. Um, it just came out like two weeks ago. Um, it's a model which is um, publicly available and actually um, helps countries to understand where the capacities are, capacity is and where the gaps exist. Um, it's available for self uh, possible to do, use it for self-assessment, um, um, but for the last five, sorry, six years now, um, the Capacity Center and its partners have um, applied it across the world. Um, you can see we have gathered um, pretty much data from the very east, uh, I think the most to the east was, if you look at this kind of map, um, Samoa to Iceland, um, so, um, Lesotho, um, Colombia, pretty much around the globe. Um, we have not done this um, alone, um, but there was a lot of partners. I just want to show them here quickly. Um, NUPI is a very important partner, so we received funding from the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs for several years now not only for this project that we have with the center in Cape Town, but also before to apply the CMM in developing countries. Um, so with the next slide, I just would like, this is a snapshot of the new edition of, this, of the CMM. 
Um, the reason is um, that um, the decision was made to review it and also look into is it still meets the requirements um, was made because yeah there there are changes and I think what it does show us is that how the requirements also for countries, not only developing countries, but countries overall change due to the change in um, threat landscape, due to the changes in, in the use of, of, of um, online services, changes of the political economic situation, etc. And this is just a snapshot. It, just, it doesn't mean that there was a lot of changes in dimension one and a, no change in, the, in dimension four, but I just would like to um, show that that um, there were things like more involvement for civil society or for private sector or the role of other stakeholders in awareness raising, the importance of international engagement, um, the importance of human rights um, and standards, um, 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 security of, of, um, of software, etc. that were reflected in this new edition. And this was not just done by the researchers in Oxford, but this was a consultation process with many stakeholders from around the world, implementers, funders, academics, uh, civil society actors, experts um, who worked, used the CM, applied the CMM, um, governments who went through a CMM process. So really kind of the new version reflects like how this, how this threat, how this landscape changes and also how the requirement change, change in particular, um, posing a, a challenge um, for, um, for developing countries. Um, when, when you were, I just would like to also to um, kind of reflect on what Patrick said about like when these assessments take place and like also which role funders and implementers play um, in, in also in, in particular in countries like Myanmar where um, yeah we, you probably come in with a good intention with a very worked out well plan but things then change. Um, However, what do we what do we see like from the experience from the assessment? I think that's also from a research perspective is that they do have a value and the the in also in countries where the where challenges may exist or you don't know what is what may be done with those learnings in the future. I of course I can't speak to um, yeah, this is correct. The the CMM was done in the context of a World Bank project. Um, as many of the C assessments are done because they inform the ideas to inform um, capacity building, to prioritize um, um, the rec um, um, investments. Um, so we work very closely with partners and they do the capacity building. Um, I'm not in the position to speak for World Bank and what how, how what how this what project followed after this and how it is now um, yeah, in the, in the current situation is um, used. Um, but what we can say, and I think that's what something um, we learn from every CMM, no matter if it's a developing country or it's in a very developer country, because I think I do agree with Patrick that it's not only about the developing countries or not only about the maybe low income countries. Many of the issues exist in many countries, no matter what the income levels are, because some countries, as you also said, countries, maybe the connection is the access to internet is so limited um, that um, actually they, um, maybe the harm that can happen to individuals might be less than other countries or sorry, not less different. Um, so the this slide shows a little bit like what the, what, where assessments and capacity building can um, already do some, something has impact and um, can inform capacity building and our becomes a capacity bill in itself is that is this issue that comes up actually in every, in every CMM review is that there's a lack of awareness. Um, not, not, it's either the high level, there might be individuals, it's seen, it's seen as this boutique issue, as Chris, you said it, uh, it's seen as something which is not really, it's very, or it's very security related, but um, these are sometimes because these assessments bringing together different, um, different stakeholders um, in the focus group discussions. You see some pictures um, um, below on the slide. Actually, on the very right hand side, you see the it's a session at the Myanmar CMM um, that you create this awareness and you're bringing people together in one room and actually encourage a discussion among stakeholders. Um, this is particularly helpful where like certain issues exist, where the capacity is very low, the people start to actually be in one room together discussing those issues, creating 
relationships with others, um, um, maybe also have the chance to exchange and kind of start off like this building trust to maybe collaborate in the future. Um, it, it, in, it can enhance internal credibility for the cybersecurity agenda with governments. Um, I think that's something when we also have the conversations when we prepare the CMMs, um, that there are some sometimes like yeah, individuals or certain departments fighting for this topic, um, but they don't get really recognition. And um, having this um, reviews has helped them to, to put this on the top of the agenda. Um, it helps to define roles and responsibilities. Um, increases funding for cybersecurity capacity building. That's important, particularly important for developing countries. Um, and is also a foundation to, to country strategy and policy development. So what um, one of the learnings is, and I think that's um, um, is really across the, across the the wealth of the countries, as um, as what the previous speakers already said, it's a very whole society across society uh, effort, um, and last and only governments and the maybe the private sector to some extent, but includes civil society and also the users. Um, the users play a very important role in cybersecurity capacity. Sometimes they get blamed for many things, but um, they also play an important part to to enhance it. Um, it's not only technical, but it's as the 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 um, CMM also reflects it um, entails legal policy training and skills, cultures and practices of users. And many governments, international organizations are increasingly investing in building the cybersecurity capacity of nations. I put the increasingly in in brackets because I think that's something which I, first I don't have any evidence for this, but I think it's right, available right now. But I think there is an increasing the increasing investment. The question it would be, and I think that's probably also something for the discussion, is it enough? Or where or is it just put in the wrong courts? Um, why is cybersecurity capacity important? Um, the colleagues, um, I can't speak too much about the theoretical framework because it's um, the brainchild of my research colleagues, but I just want to show you the theoretical framework that um, the colleagues used to uh, look into yeah, what actually defines cybersecurity capacity? Does it matter? Um, and it looks at the, the size of the country, how the size of the country, the wealth, the, the, the use and the, the level of centrality of the internet um, actually infor um, informs um, the capacity and also like what is the actually end user experience. Um, this is the colleagues did this research on this um, taking 73 countries. Um, um, from the CMM data set, because that was the status last year. Um, by now we have 86 um, CMMs completed with our partners, our partners have completed. Um, and what it shows that there is a divide between country, like richer countries and poorer countries. Many of those countries are in, in lower stages of capacity building. I must say that almost 40% um, of that data set are developing countries. Um, some of them are like um, middle or lower middle income, so there's a bit of it, but it's but it doesn't it's not entirely developing countries. I think that's also under under underlines the 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 point that it's not always the developing countries who's who are like the weakest links, um, but it's probably much more complex to say actually where the weak link is. Um, but there's definitely definitely a difference between um, um, the the GDP and the wealth of a nation and how 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 good the capacity is. Um, national choice on building capacity have implications for end users um, and how they perceive how free the internet is or how they use it and like how how they safe they feel. Um, you can see that at like yeah also um, um, like how yeah. Um, e-government and e-commerce services are used, but I think it also underlines the case that if it comes to developing countries, why it's important that many people who are come and that's in the context of digital transformation and bringing people on the internet, how important it is to have cybersecurity capacity in place, if it's awareness, having the technical things, because if people come into online for the first time, and certain issues happen, actually the, the harm that can happen and the, the impact on the digital transformation can be really um, um, impactful. Um, the last point I would like to make is that there's no one size that fits all. 
so that's also something that, that the data shows that even if countries might be like may more mature on the legal frameworks and have put certain things into place, um, but don't have a strategy, but they don't have a strategy, um, but are, have other have um, um, have very poor legal frameworks or things are still in developing. There are different approaches and I think there are different kind of correlations between the different factors of the CMM. That's an ongoing research, so I advise also everyone to stay tuned. Um, but what we could say is that, yeah, it has to become a priority. Um, it has to be better understood, like what, where to invest. Um, if there's increasing investment and efforts into cybersecurity, like where could it be spent better? And I agree that uh, with everyone, like the co coordination is really key. Um, we do observe we, um, from like when we, when assessments are taking place, uh, we actually observe like, yeah, things happen. We always try to coordinate, but then maybe certain things happened and um, then you later find out that an assessment took place two months earlier. Um, and uh, um, yeah, this is just the beginning when we talk about if you see assessment at the beginning of, a, of an NCS development, for instance. So that's I'm happy, happy for open for discussion. Last but not least, um, this is a slide to uh, what Chris said earlier. This is the Civil Portal, also project where Nupi and we are involved. Um, here's the, um, we can also Google it, but this is the URL for those who, who, who also joined us later. Um, yeah, so I hand over back to Neil. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Caroline. It was uh, very interesting to hear about uh, the impressive work you're doing at uh, the Global Cybersecurity Capacity Center in Oxford. Uh, 73 countries, it's uh, quite a lot of work and a lot of data there to, to look at. And um, I also think it was very interesting that you also mentioned uh, that it's it's not only the develop or the difficulties of finding the weakest link. It's often not only in the developing countries, it could be anywhere else actually. So very interesting. Um, and with that, um, I'm sure I'm sure we will get back to that uh, issue after after uh, the talks and in the discussion. Uh, so but, but with that, I will give the uh, the floor to our final and uh, final speaker, Andrea uh, Calderaro. Uh, you have done research on this topic and recently published uh, an article in Third World Quarterly uh, on policy challenges in cybersecurity uh, and in cybersecurity capacity building. And uh, we really look forward to, to what you have to say, Andrea. Uh, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Nils. Thank you, Nils. Thanks for the introduction and actually for having organized this, uh, this, this meeting. Um, well, I'm the last, as you will say, the, the last speaker of the session, so I have the impression that we already have a, a lot of uh, issues on the table. So I'm going to take advantage of this role of this uh, being the last and trying also to connect the dots a bit. So I promise to mention Myanmar in, as, a, as an example and to, uh, to address the series of issues that have been mentioned by my uh, panel mates. So um, I would like to uh, reflect uh, in the next 10 minutes uh, what we uh, could do uh, more, what we could do in this new phase of, of cyber capacity building. And they refer as a new phase. And this, of course, is open for discussion because I have the impression that uh, we, 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 we clearly can identify the first phase where uh, in, in the last years we've been very much engaged into, in doing three main things. Uh, as Caroline has just uh, introduced to us, I mean, we've been very much focusing in, uh, in trying to understand what capacities really uh, countries are supposed to develop. And uh, of course, the premium or what kind of support we could provide to these countries. And in order to do that, of course, it was very important to uh, develop uh, uh, um, effective assessment strategies. So the, the Oxford Cyber Capacity Building uh, uh, Maturity Model is an um, outstanding achievement. Uh, also, Patrick, anyway, with the, also with the uh, European uh, Operational Guidance on Cyber Capacity, that was also major achievements because uh, we really identified the variety of uh, uh, issues where we could address when we want to uh, achieve cyber capacity. And the ITU has their own uh, cyber uh, capacity building index that 
takes in account uh, like more than 30 indicators. So there is a lot of work and, uh, and uh, successful uh, uh, experience we had in, th in that effort. Um, another effort we put, we put a lot of effort in trying to identify the right interlocutors, uh, trying to engage with governments in the Global South and trying to convince them that now that they are overcome the digital divide, they are connected, they really need to, um, in order to make the most of their gain connectivity, they really need to uh, understand how to protect themselves from, um, from a series of, of threats. And we've done that. I mean, the Global Forum of Cyber Expertise, as Chris well uh, uh, introduced, uh, really uh, done really well there because uh, now, uh, I remember what you mentioned, like more than 80 uh, members now in uh, only state actors, members of the GFC, which is a major achievement, a major efforts in coordinating this effort and convincing again these countries to engage in, in cyber capacity building activities. That has been done. I mean, most of countries have the impression they now develop their own national cybersecurity strategy. They establish their own computer emergency response teams and cyber capacity is clearly at the center of most of national uh, strategies. And finally, as we mentioned as well, international cooperation. We uh, really um, put a lot of effort in uh, making cyber capacity at the center of international cooperation in the context of cyber security. And uh, just a few weeks ago, with the cyber capacity, it's really evident. This really takes a lot of space in the UN Open Ended Working Group on cyber security. And that is also is a major achievement. So what's, what, what's next? Uh, well, the impression is that what we, um, and with this I actually try to answer also to a few questions that emerged here from, from Chris and, and Patrick as well. I mean, the fact that uh, we approach cyber capacity, we get a lot of things for granted. I mean, we, looking at this from an academic perspective, we really uh, got inspiration from security studies. And security studies really looked at, uh, give priorities to uh, protect state actors from internal and external threats. We get for granted that developing cybersecurity capacity, that's what it, what it meant. Also, because we, uh, we uh, engage mostly with governments, because it was easier to engage with governments, because especially in countries in the Global South, uh, those are the actors that are more visible in international venues and so on. But uh, um, this is clearly not enough. I mean, what we're also learning now, we learn uh, in, in the last years, so not now really in today, but uh, is the, the fact that protection, the protection of, of, of the cyber domain is a shared responsibilities among a variety of actors. State actors do have their own responsibilities, but also civil society, that are the people that are mostly exposed to connectivity because they are clearly, uh, um, well, not only users of the internet, but also producers of contents. Uh, and uh, uh, we have industry that owns the infrastructure, state actors rarely owns piece of infrastructure, telecom operators owns infrastructure and they offer services. So they really need to a major responsibility when it comes to uh, the protection of the cyber domain. And uh, so uh, this means that we really need to recognize that uh, different actors do have a, a different, uh, um, to, to, do have a role in the protection of the cyber domain. And this means that we need to develop different topologies of capacities. I mean, multi-stakeholderism, it's clearly something that is emerging now as a key priority in the cybersecurity domain and also is reflected in, uh, in the in cyber capacity building efforts. As we mentioned, uh, GFC is, a, is, a, is, a, is a clearly um, a good example in that direction. So how this could be reflected in the uh, cyber uh, capacity, in our approach to cyber capacity? So even there, when we, we can pick uh, some inspirations from uh, other fields beyond uh, the, the cyber domain. And the capacity building, again, in academic terms, usually consists of identifying three key issues. So first of all, we need to target the, which are the communities that we uh, think needs to develop uh, cyber capacity. We've done this so far by targeting governments most of the times, uh, and it's clear that we need to target uh, uh, other stakeholders because we, we agree that protection of cyber is a shared responsibilities between industry, civil society and state actors. 
So, um, yes, major effort in that direction, definitely, uh, trying to engage with, uh, with, uh, with civil society and uh, bypass governments. And this is crucial by passing governments, especially when we deal with countries in the global south. Countries in the global south, uh, they are diverse, more diverse than the block of countries that we label as countries in the global north. Um, because uh, they, they, especially when it comes to political context, I mean, the Myanmar case is, is a clear example there. It's true, we've been following the Myanmar case for since they launched their connectivity building process in 2012. And uh, because uh, it was um, it's, it was uh, it is still an uh, uh, interesting experience, and um, and that is a, is a clear example that we need to be careful who we want to which capacity which which uh, to who we want to deliver our cyber capacity building efforts because in that case we invested in in the government. I, I have to say that there were. My funding was not for the EU, but was an academic from funding for University of Pennsylvania. So in that case, I was uh, personally, my experience was that I was mostly actually engaging with civil society because in that case it was for myself. Do can we really trust this government? Do we really uh, is an authority was an authoritarian regime until yesterday? And uh, do we really uh, can we really trust the government are really sure that the, this government is not going to use this connectivity infrastructure in order to develop new monitoring strategies and because of that I was actually engaging with civil society and trying to uh, develop uh, their capacity to be critical. So I remember there was this whole process about the, the, the release of the telecom law and in that case uh, uh, was engaging with civil society trying to uh, uh, offer a critical perspective in the occasion of the, of the, of the open consultation. But uh, in general that's exactly what we need to do. We need to be careful when we engage with capacity building, uh, when investing capacity building efforts in countries in the global south. And the fact that we really clearly need to bypass governments and most of the times that is crucial, not only because governments, they already achieve what they wanted to achieve. They do have the national cybersecurity strategy. They do have their cert in place. Cybercrime laws are in place as well. So there is a lot of work to do there, but not saying that is enough, but it's say that it's about time to target a few new communities and civil society is key here. So another things that we uh, usually again back to this, the three things that we need to discuss when we want to address capacity building beyond the cyber is, um, I mean, uh, the target and uh, what capacities we need to develop. And this is something that we again, we addressed a lot in this first phase, what I see as a first phase of cyber capacity building, but if we want to target the new communities, then we probably we need to reflect a bit further on that. We uh, each communities do have different needs. Again, the example: a government needs to uh, design a national cybersecurity strategy. Civil society, not really. Civil society, they probably more interested in understanding how to protect themselves, also from governments in case of in the Myanmar, for example, or in other authoritarian regime. And uh, and these are initiatives that needs to definitely be uh, further developed. And the third step is uh, how. Well, the how is again, it depends on the context. It depends on uh, what do we want to achieve, which capacity we want to uh, not transfer because in building is about socializing capacities and uh, which communities. Uh, and um, I mean, we, we agree that uh, we need to invest a bit more efforts in, 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 in developing capacity in communities. It's clear even there we could pick some other experience coming from other fields uh, that is always useful. And um, yeah, research has been mentioned by Chris and that's why also the GFC has invested now a lot in, in this direction. Research is crucial. I mean, we have a, a lot of research coming from other fields that prove that offering evidence that um, developing um, local know-how is first of all is the best strategy that we can uh, um, have when it comes to developing a, a national cyber strategy and uh, the local know-how could be done training is not enough because as we said we have read that there are a lot of trainings already going on it's more a bit a more long-term process which comes with academia research academic programs that is something that is usually a successful way to go and uh, thanks to also for mentioning about the, 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 my paper on that the history that focus really on the cyber domain uh, that tells that the number of uh, 
uh, academic outputs when it, and academic programs uh, in countries actually is uh, um, makes countries more cyber cyber capable than uh, the fact that countries are exposed to cyber threats, which is uh, an approach that is usually adopted in the in the more traditional security domain. So just to again, I mean, conclude and put all these things together in order to answer to our first, uh, to my actually first question, probably as, as a question that we might want to explore a bit further, what we could do even better. Definitely, again, take a more holistic approach on cyber, as has been also well mentioned by, 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 by Chris. Uh, cyber is not necessarily cyber security, and uh, even cybersecurity depends from which perspective you are looking at cybersecurity. From a human rights perspective, we need to focus on the human security dimension of the cyber. From a state perspective, we're going to keep talking about cybersecurity, but we need to definitely take a more holistic approach on the concept of cyber. And based on that, we need to intervene and target the communities that um, we believe to be more, um, based on the context, uh, uh, not yet cyber capable and because of that they are in need of our, of our help um, yes that's open for discussion Niels and colleagues thank you very much uh, andrea uh, very interesting uh, talk about this um, academic perspectives and future perspectives um, uh, we have been uh, talking a lot about uh, cyber security capacity building now and uh, various things uh, about it. As we all have learned, it is a very broad topic with a lot of different uh, avenues to, to, to follow. Um, for instance, the flip side of uh, cyber security capacity building, uh, like does it uh, lead to, to improve the development or, or and the mining development, this could be a, a separate uh, seminar of its own, I think. And uh, I think it is a, it's a very important question, but it is a bit too big question to, to really dig deep into here. Um, but of course, uh, I'm, I very absolutely appreciate that it has been mentioned and we could also follow this in, in the discussion if you really, really want to. Um, I also think that um, Another very interesting topic that has been mentioned is the need to have a holistic approach on this uh, topic and that all of you uh, have mentioned that uh, the, the, uh, the need to look at uh, this as a core development topic and, or a cross-cutting development uh, topic. Um, and uh, that also leads to, to a question of whether whether you should uh, look at uh, or, or approach this uh, uh, this cha the, the challenges uh, pertaining to to cyber security capacity building to approach this through traditional development uh, through a traditional development approach or rather try to think innovatively uh, and through a new to the through the new multi-stakeholder approach to this topic so so that's another thing i would like to to dig more into uh, for the discussion and um, and also uh, all of you have also mentioned this as a very important uh, topic there's uh, as we learned from chris there's a consensus among uh, 193 countries in the un in the open and the working group there uh, even though there's not uh, really uh, a lot of resources allocated uh, to this and uh, even though this is uh, high on the agenda perhaps in many uh, uh, arenas and forums and networks and organizations that are discussing cybersecurity there's still some challenges to how it is being understood is it being understood as a technological question or or business question or something else and and it is also, uh, I think, um, uh, a challenge that it is not perhaps, um, or, or it, it, it's, it's something that we could also, I would like you to look into this in the discussion. Why? Why is it this topic still only being discussed in these uh, specific arenas uh, uh, dedicated to, to cybersecurity and not, for instance, uh, lifted up in uh, higher 
uh, for us. Like for instance, it's it's being really discussed in the UN, but it's not being discussed in the UN's Security Council. So why is that? Uh, so uh, I, I think that we could, if I if I may ask the the, the panelists to to just briefly uh, give their thoughts uh, about uh, our uh, seminar so far, and perhaps also dig into some of these questions that I raised now uh, even more. Uh, I would really appreciate that. And uh, if you all agree, we could just uh, uh, go in the same order like we, we, we did uh, initially. So we could start with Chris, then Patrick and Caroline, and then Andrea. So Chris, if you would like to begin, the floor is yours. Sure. And, and I should start by just uh, pointing people to uh, the GFC's website, just because I, I neglected to mention it, and, and Carolyn was so good at mentioning uh, our, the uh, the civil one. It's www.thegfce.org. So there's lots of information on it there. Uh, you know, a couple of things. One, I want to comment on um, on a couple of things other folks said about the weakest link issue, and, and I think the weakest link is not just. I mean, I think the weakest link, in a sense is a pitch for more developed countries because um, it, it, it is telling them no matter who they are, there's something in it for them. So even though, you know, obviously you want people to give money and funds out of the goodness of their hearts and to help the world community, and sometimes that happens, but sometimes it doesn't happen. But I think you can also make the argument to, to more developed countries that you're helping yourselves by doing this because uh, if these are essentially end up being safe havens or ways that are very difficult to interdict these various intrusions or attacks uh, because uh, criminals and nation states route their communications through them because they don't have good laws or enforcement or technical capabilities, that hurts you. So it's in your interest, uh, you know, your own interest to, to, to help build up these resources everywhere. And on uh, the point about whether it's just a developing world, of course it's not. I mean, I agree, Carolyn, that, you know, this is something that's very broad. You know, just in, in the case of Norway, one of our, uh, projects we had early on out of the GFC was Norway. Um, they were working on their third cyber strategy, I think. And so they profiled how the process they used for the third one, how that contrasted with their second one and first one, which is very valuable to countries who are also even more developed countries who are looking at their second or third strategy. But it's also helpful to the countries who are working on their first. So, so that knowledge sharing between lots of different countries, even between, you know, more developed countries with each other, I think is very valuable in this space. So it's not just limited to developing, but because our seminar was more focused on on the developing world, uh, you know, I wanted to stress that because, you know, they have all the problems that developed countries have, but they also often lack the resources uh, to address them. And so that's something I think we need we need to look at. Um, on, on the point of why this is not being viewed, you know, I think it's, first of all, I think it's a hybrid. I think it's you, you approach this both as a um, a traditional development goal, like work with those institutions who are traditionally involved in development, go to those various development agencies from national governments. Uh, but you also do the hybrid model. You do the more multi-stakeholder model. I think you can do both. I think we need to do both. And the, the, the question of why this hasn't percolated as much as a priority, you know, I think that's that really describes cyber overall, sadly. I mean, we've been talking about this for 20 years, literally. And you said in my introduction, I've been doing this for more than 25 years. Now it's over 30 years. <laughs> so, so I've seen a long uh, history of this and it has gotten better. I mean, there is more attention to be sure. You know, in the US, you know, you have uh, President Biden talking about how important cybersecurity is. That's great. Uh, you're hearing that you know, more in Europe. Uh, you're seeing that more around the world. That's great. Um, but there still is this little bit of magic around cybersecurity where a lot of the you know, more political leaders think, oh, this technical issue, I'm not sure I really grasp this. And, and just like you don't need to be a nuclear engineer to understand the, the national security and, and economic and other policies around nuclear uh, issues, you don't need to be a coder to understand the issues that are around uh, cyber issues. And so I think it's, it is important that we mainstream this, that we demystify it. And we, you know, make it part of the the overall fabric of policy that governments and uh, the others deal with. I think we're on the train to do that. I think we need to accelerate that. Um, we often refer to ourselves. I think you said this early on as a cyber, you know, uh, I, there's lots of terms: the cyber gypsies, the cyber clan, the cyber whatever you call. It. I mean, we where we we move from conference to conference and we all talk to each other, and that's important. 
but it's far more important for us to reach the other decision makers, uh, participate in these larger meetings with, uh, you know, ministers of foreign affairs, ministers of interior, uh, business leaders. Um, the the conference that, that was launched in London, the London process was a good conference for that because it bring brought those other parties in. And we, I think we need something like that to continue to raise us on the global stage, uh, including in the UN. And there's been a little discussion. Estonia had a discussion of the Security Council on this, but I think there needs to be more there as well. So, so agree. I mean, I think one of the challenges for all of us, not just for capacity building, but generally, is to put this more as a, a as a priority, and that I think will help with capacity building as well. I, I'd say one other thing. I think that. You know, the silver lining to things like COVID is now that people are so dependent on these technologies, it's apparent to a lot of people why we need to address this where maybe it wasn't really real to them before. That's a good point, uh, Chris. Thank you very much. Uh, Patrick, would you like to continue? Uh, yes, a few quick points. So uh, I saw also a question in the, um, in the chat that Ola has asked about the development community. I think Maybe it's a sort of um, um, EU perversion, but you know, whenever whenever I hear that the development community is behind, um, I think for me it's a sort of a problem that uh, is not always present in the EU. I mean, development community on the EU side has actually been one of the drivers of having uh, the for capacity building on the agenda. So, uh, I think when we talk about the EU itself. Uh, development has always been there. Of course, we may always wish for a deeper conversation and maybe much more pronounced and political level of involvement when it, does, when it comes to cyber capacity building uh, within the EU itself. Uh, but that dichotomy development political level um, actually has been only to some extent a challenge uh, within the EU, maybe in other countries uh, more so. Uh, but I think there is another interesting point um, if we continue with the uh, with the Andreas presentation of those different stages and phases of uh, uh, development of a cyber capacity building community and what we should be looking at next. And that's partly linked to the discussion about the development community. Uh, I think whenever we talk about them, we also assume that it's a very static community. You know, that the development community today is what it was five, 10 years ago, and it's absolutely not. You know, if you look at the moves that have happened within the UK, we have the merge between uh, FCO and the development agency. If you look at the EU, uh, former DG DEFCO is now renamed into international partnerships. And those moves stem, stem from the recognition that development is no longer only a political tool that serves development. More and more, actually, development becomes one of the instruments that states and different actors want to use to pursue their political objectives. And I think that is actually a big change that we have seen over the past 10 years. 10 years ago, development community traditionally would not really want to engage in a political discussion. That is, uh, that is not the case anymore. And I think the second big uh, factor that we as a uh, cyber capacity building community have to face, and that again puts us in a slightly different environment nowadays than maybe five years ago even, is the fact that uh, you know that the donor community has also changed. It's not all. It's not anymore. You know, UK, US, EU, uh, or even Norway. You know, more and more countries and more in the direction in which we're looking more and more is China that is actually investing very heavily. If you look at digital Silk Road and how uh, active they have been across Asia and, uh, and Africa, uh, you look more and more in the direction of the Arab Peninsula, where the donors also are becoming more and more active. So I think uh, this question of um, uh, you know, what kind of uh, cyber capacity building should we be doing? Do we have to be more critical and more careful where we engage is a very valid one. But then that's a question that gets confronted with the geopolitical reality of today, which basically makes us think, well, it's, if it's not us, there are other actors that will be feeling, willing to fill in that gap. And if we start putting too many conditions on the table, uh, our partners in Africa, Asia, Latin America have others to choose from that maybe have 
a sort of a lower standards than than we are thinking, right? So I think there is this very difficult uh, dilemma in the policy uh, question that we have to answer as a as a sort of a policymakers, researchers, uh, and experts active in the field of uh, of cyber capacity building. And I wish I had the answer to that, but I don't. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Uh, we were expecting an answer there, Patrick, but uh, okay, next time then. <laughs> next time, deal. <laughs> Caroline, would you like to go? Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I just would like to uh, use like the structure that Andrea, you suggested and uh, to give some feedback, like input, which capacities and how. Um, I mean, it's 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 a, it must be a holistic approach. Um, and I think that's probably also needs to, to, to maybe inform a little bit the answer to Patrick's uh, the question he tried to answer but also to to look like where actually um, yeah the, the the gaps are um, I mean there has to be there has to be capacity building in in governments in um, in uh, um, incidents response cap capabilities have to improved um, but also really down to the single user um, it's uh, there must be users who understand uh, what they get into if they send their money from A to B. What does it mean if I send my um, my my medical condition via text message? What are the risks and how would I need to do? And we're not talking about people who have uh, maybe for any kind of form of education, but this also includes people who may don't have a, a lot of education or maybe even or, and or belong to a vulnerable group. So it must be very holistically. And I think um and in, involve many i think that's probably also where um there is um, probably a lot a lot to do and so far um many of these activities where it comes for instance to users are really solely with um, financial institutions and maybe some tel isps because it's kind of part of their business but it's not really approached in a in a very consistent holistic way it's just an idea uh, one observation from the when we do the assessments, we want to do this in a multi-stakeholder way. So we would like we want to consult at each assessment, we want to consult with experts in the country, and we do have big issues, challenges to find people in many countries to identify people, organizations from the from civil society who can be invited. And then you see always like the same individuals from one organizations who are the expert for that country. So. Um, and um, and then you have this on outspoken post person who's maybe very well, very very really an expert, very well trained. So you meet the person at every conference, probably part of the gypsies. Um, but um, there's really like not a lot of like in, in, um, civil society who can really meaningful engage in this con discussions and conversations and contribute. Um, I think there's there's something uh, definitely um, to do um, because. Um, 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 in the end, there, there was there's, there, they are those who can actually also help. For hopefully, um, if things happen like in Myanmar now, and I mean, we did another country which is renowned for its probably critical um, handling of human rights, uh, where we also spoke to civil society people. But again, like two who were pointed to us from different international organizations working with civil society. So I think that's something which is really important. Um, um, and the other thing I wanted to say, um, because um, Chris, you mentioned it, uh, we just started a small research project on cybersecurity uh, um, in the working from home environment as a result of the COVID pandemic and like what issues came up. And actually, so this is a really early stage, it's really early finding, but actually what the kind of like perception is, cybersecurity actually enabled working from home because organizations perceive the machines and the, the behavior of their stuff as, as um, appropriate and safe, they, they actually the possibility to work for outside the offices um, was enabled. So that's just a side note I wanted to mention. Um, otherwise, over to Andrea, thank you. Thank you, Caroline. Uh, Andrea, the floor is yours. Yes, I won't take too much time because probably also curious to hear some some questions from 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 the floor. Um, yes, I mean I, absolutely. I mean I would just do a short following up from what Caroline was just saying. It's absolutely is is the main challenge that we have is the fact that we we want to develop cyber capacity 
beyond the governments. We want to target other communities, but it's difficult to engage with those communities because most of the times they don't have the understanding or the capacity to engage with us. So it's a kind of a really a, a dilemma. A bit of, we, we got a bit in, in circle here. Um, Actually, it's a good example is the UN Open Ended Working Group uh, and uh, this whole process. Uh, that was a, a wonderful multi stakeholder with a mission to be a, a wonderful multi stakeholder approach. But if we look at the number of interventions and statements, uh, most of the those really come from the usual suspects. Uh, we have a very limited number of uh, uh, non state actors from the global south. Uh, uh, contributing to the discussion. So that is clearly a challenge and that's why I was referring to this as a challenge for a new potential phase of cyber capacity. And uh, also again bypassing governments because uh, especially in authoritarian regime or in countries with the dubious approach on the concept of democracy, they don't, we cannot rely on them to, uh, to, to, to to engage with other actors. So most of the times these governments don't really give us access to, to, other, to other actors. So we need, really need to, to identify to open our channel of communication with other 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 communities. Um, yes, that's uh, that's it. I mean I actually open to I mean even Patrick made a, a exciting point probably that deserves a whole round table itself about the geopolitics of cyber capacity. That is a, is a, is really another uh, exciting things that we'd love to discuss for a couple of more hours. Okay, thank you, Andrea. <clears throat> I think we actually have um, managed to touch upon most of the questions that have been posed in the uh, Q&A by the audience. There has been some questions that they haven't uh, really been able to go into. But uh, but we have to finish for today, uh, unfortunately. Uh, but the conversation will uh, for sure uh, go on. Um, and the research project that we have and which is financed by the, the Norwegian MFA will will go on for uh, some more time uh, and capacity building will, of course, continue. Uh, we will arrange more events. We will have more publications, uh, so please continue to, to follow us. But uh, I think for now is the it's time to, to give a big thank you to our excellent speakers. Uh, you won't have an applause, of course, in, uh, in Teams, but uh, you deserve it, yes. Uh, and thank you once again to our partners and supporters and uh, who, who, who have made this uh, event possible and also to the audience who followed us and asked very good uh, questions. So the webinar is now uh, closed. Thank you.